friends, Jerry Rosa here in the Rosa String Works Workshop. Back in March, a good customer friend of mine, Spencer from up in Fayette, Missouri, brought this guitar in. I'm going to have Melissa cut to that clip right now, and then we're going to get busy working on this thing. Hello friends, Jerry Rosa here in the Rosa String Works Workshop, holding on to a really nice old 1950-ish Gibson, uh, I believe this was an F12 according to Spencer, and this is Spencer right here from Fayette, Missouri. He brought it over for me to look at. Boy, it's a nice one, I gotta tell you. It's got the tone. You find good ones and then you find the really good ones, and this is one of those really good ones. got that nice bottom end sound. But I don't think he needs any work done on this one. He just brought it so I could drool over it, you know? <laughs> That's a nice one. That's one of those keepers. You, you keep this one when you get this one. <laughs> Let me show him this other one that you brought, Spence. He brought a really cool guitar here. Now you're gonna get to see this in a future video. It's not gonna be right away or anything, but just look at that peg head on that little sucker. I don't even think I've ever seen one of those before. Tell them what you know about it, Spencer. Well, all I know is, is I think it's a K-Craft product, and it, it has quite a following among uh, jazz and swing players. I've seen, I've seen a couple of good players on the internet playing that similar, well, the same, either the same model or, or, or yeah. a very similar model. I saw one with a, that had had a little fancier inlay, had diamond inlays instead of dots. Those are probably the biggest dots I believe I've ever they seen. Are big, yeah. They are about the biggest ones I've seen. And at one time I can tell it did have a pick guard on it. Otherwise it looks pretty original, really. I imagine those are even the original tuning keys based on what I'm seeing there because I don't see where they've been replaced. The pick guard just completely deteriorated and it, bro that, broke in half. I see. Yeah. I think what this is in for, right, is a uh, neck reset. The action here, you could throw a dog through there, I'm pretty sure. It's up pretty high. But uh, we can do that and uh, we'll put this in queue and get to it down the road. It's got, it's got a few, uh, you know, you know, you could do some trench warfare here down <laughs> in the fretboard. There's some pretty deep trenches wore out in there. I think you could hide from grenades in there, actually. But other than that, uh, that just shows somebody loved it and played it a lot. <laughs> but it's really a really neat old guitar. I'm looking forward to doing this one. You'll see this on a future video. Well, we're about ready to, to tear into this old guitar. And the first thing we're going to look at is the action. It's very high. And at the 12th fret here, and I think it's worth noting that the 12th fret is a single dot. You see the double dots here and the double dots here, but the 12th fret is a single dot which is kind of unusual. You don't see that very often. The action is pretty darn high, but it's, it's, it's about 145 thousandths on the large E string. Now the small E string's not on here at the moment, but on the B string, it's about the same. So it's just real high. Now one thing I've noticed already is that at this fret here at the body line, it looks like there's a hole been drilled on either side of the fret, if you can see it there. Maybe you can take a close look at that and see it. But it looks like maybe they've already drilled a hole in here. Maybe this neck has already been off once before. That would be my guess. You know, at the moment, the neck, it doesn't appear to be loose. I don't think it is loose. I'd hate to take it off if we don't have to. You know, it's 145 thousandths, so to get it down to a hundred thousandths, would, which would be, you know, I think reasonable, we'd have to take 80 thousandths out of this. So I think we're going to look and just to see, uh, you know, how much can we take out of this before we would really need to do a neck reset. So I think that's my first point of, uh, of contention here is just to look at this and, and study it and decide whether I could get it out of here. Otherwise, we will probably have to do a neck reset. I noticed that the head on this screw holding the strap button on here on the heel of the neck was a hex style. Actually, it's the star is the uh, like T20 or whatever you call that. I forget the name now. I know it, but I can't think of it. Like T25 or T30 fit there. 
Torx, that's what I was trying to think of. And anyway, uh, I think that's the, a long enough screw to hold the strap button on. That's about a uh, two and a half inch screw at minimum, maybe three inches. And so I'm sure that that went in, not only did it go through, I mean like right about there is about where it would be. So you can imagine it went in through the whole block and probably went all the way through the block. That's kind of something. And I was thinking that that might be what's holding the neck on. And I think it is because now that I've taken that screw out, I think I see a, a slight crack opening up in the neck. In fact, I'm pretty sure I do. So with all that knowledge and the fact that they've got a hole here, and the fact that this is low, I guess I'm gonna take the strings off of this and see if I can get this neck to move a little bit. If it's wiggly or whatever, I think I may just go ahead and take the neck off of it. In terms of trying to decide whether we need a neck reset on this guitar or not, I've got my straight edge on here. There is a slight underbow in the neck. It's not real bad, but I have the straight edge sitting on all the frets, and if I bring it back to this bridge, you can see that the straight edge is below the top of this by, I would say, every bit of a quarter inch and perhaps as much as three eighths of an inch, where it should just about be sitting on that. About level would be real good. So the neck angle is pretty bad. Can we cut that much out of this? I don't know. We don't need to cut out a quarter inch, but as I was saying before, to get it down to a hundred thousandths, we'd probably have to cut at least 80 thousandths out of this. And we could possibly get that off the bottom of the saddle, I think. The uh, adjusters are up a little bit too, so they could probably go down just a little bit. I'll put them all the way down. And let's just retest it here and see if that made any difference. Not a ton of difference, but it made some. It may have made enough to, to make it playable. I thought that when I saw it strung up the first time, I actually thought those were all the way down, but after I got it off, I noticed they weren't. So that might have been enough to make it playable, but it would just barely be playable, and it would still be a little bit high. In reality, to me, it's off by quite a bit, and by quite a bit, if you can see and I don't know if I can hold this all together. If you can see how much gap there is low the straight edge and the end of the fretboard, then I think you can kind of get an idea about how much the neck angle is off there. So it's off by a pretty good amount. Um, you know, at this end here, if this was raised up almost an eighth of an inch, or about an eighth of an inch, it would be pretty close. So it's pretty darn low. I still am debating with myself whether I want to go to that level of issue and, and take this apart. It would probably be better in the long run and you know it, the guitar would last much longer and the setup would last much longer if I did a neck reset. So I think that may be the answer and I think I may just go for it. Other thing I've noticed, there's something loose right here at the edge of this hole. It almost looks like it's a brace. I've never seen a brace come up to the edge of one of these holes before. Maybe someone put a cleat in there perhaps, although I don't really see a break there, but it does appear to be loose, whatever it is, right at the edge. So I'll try to get my little internal camera in there and we'll take a look at that and see what that is as well. I think you can see I've got the camera inside and that little square thing right there is what I'm seeing loose at the edge of the sound hole. So that little square thing right there is what you can see at the edge of the uh, sound hole. And I'm seeing that corner of it right there is what I'm seeing. So it does look like it is a cleat of some sort. What I'm trying to figure out is why this discoloration in the wood that doesn't really make a lot of sense to me either. I don't know. I, I don't really see a reason for that. It almost looks like the wood's been replaced in that area, but I don't think so because it looks perfect on the outside. I don't know. It's hard to explain some of the things you run across in instruments. It's kind of difficult to hold those cameras still on the inside of the instrument, but I believe I got a good enough look at it to know that that is just some sort of a little scab somebody put up in there. I don't know why exactly, because I don't really see a break. Although, as I say that, if I look at it at the right light, there looks like there could be a hairline crack there. Where I see the hairline crack, 
doesn't line up with where I see the cleat that they put inside. So go figure. It is what it is, as I say. I'm not going to worry about it. And I think I am just going to knock it loose because it doesn't appear to be necessary, whatever it is. So whatever that is that's in there, I am just going to see if I can knock it down loose. Now that I'm moving it, it almost feels like it's tape with the end of this. I believe it is. I believe it's some kind of a paper or a tape or something like that. So apparently it is not a cleat. Let me see if I can get my other finger in there and try to get a hold of it. Yeah, it's some kind of paper and it just fell out or maybe it was some kind of tape. So apparently it was nothing real important. And for those of you who are curious, there's a better look at it. It's just a piece of what I would think is masking tape is what it looks like that's been folded over on itself. Why it was even up in there, I have no idea. Probably by accident. Well, you can see I'm about ready to steam the neck off of this thing. I've got my little needle there that the steam will pass through. If you look over here, you, you can see I have a hot plate and a tea kettle. And the kettle, I made a special end for it so that it will force the steam through here. Now this hot plate doesn't get crazy hot, so I don't think there's any damage of anything blowing up on me. I will pay attention to it and if it starts to sound scary or if the steam is blowing through too quickly, then we'll pay attention to that. But this is the first time I've used it with this new nozzle. And of course the nozzle is just a friction fit on top of there. Worst came to worst, it would blow the nozzle off, which could be dangerous. So I will point th that away from me, just in case. But I don't think that's gonna be much of an issue. It's now getting warm, and I would think in just a few minutes, we'll start seeing steam coming through the hose. I am just using the hole that was already drilled there. I did not try to drill any new holes. And it, apparently it went down in there pretty far. And I'm assuming that they hit the pocket. I don't even know that for sure. In fact, they may not have hit it. I don't really know. It could just be a big drill hole that I'm in. You can see we're starting to get a little steam action going through here now. So I'm gonna put it in here. It's not a lot, but it's some. So there's some air moving through there. And I can see a little more steam now starting to move. So I think we're actually making some progress now, finally. The hot plate has already turned itself off. That's the one good thing about this hot plate is it doesn't get so terribly hot. So I don't think I have to worry too much about it blowing the cap off of the steamer there. I can tell you this is getting really hot right now, the hose, so it is definitely working now. And I can even hear the steam coming out the end, which I've never been able to do before. So apparently my new cap is working pretty well. It's working pretty well. I can see the steam bubbling through here. Maybe you can see it now. You can see it actually bubble through every once in a while. So I think that's working just fine. And yes, I know about the new element where they heat and stick it down in there and it supposedly is a miracle cure, but I haven't tried that yet. I have my doubts about that. It may be the best thing, I don't know. This has always worked well for me, so that's what I'm doing on this guitar since I don't have the other method available. If anyone else has used the dry method and uh, would want to make a comment in the comments on, you know, comparing the two methods, I would appreciate it because I have not used the dry heat method yet on putting the probe down inside the neck. But this is definitely heating up. This is very hot. In fact, I don't recall ever feeling this this hot so I know the steam is definitely getting in there much better than it's ever done before. You can hear the steam escaping through this needle. I don't see any movement yet though. So this is a little bit like watching paint dry so since you're not really seeing anything happening other than the steam is going in here I'll uh, turn the camera off for a little while and if, if we make some progress I'll show you where we're at. Well really no sooner than I turn the camera off I actually started seeing movement in this. It's moving pretty good. You probably can't tell it very well in the video, but if I could hold it still, you can see the neck is moving back here, especially compared to the top. Seems to be moving pretty well, actually. And I'm starting to see moisture coming through the neck quite a bit. So I'm just gonna keep wiggling it like this, because the more you wiggle it, the more moisture works its way into the cracks and stuff and eventually it'll come loose. 
it's getting looser and looser by the second now. And now if I can go up and down with it a little bit, that might help a little bit too. Yeah, that steamer works much, much better now that I've made that new end for it. It's working so much better, it's really almost no comparison to the way it worked before. In fact, I think we're good enough that I'm just going to turn it off because I'm pretty sure this neck will come out of here now. What I think I might do is get the little neck press that I have and see if we can press this out of there. Well, I put the clamp on here and started tightening it up and then I took the rubber mallet and hit the metal on the back there which is on the bottom of the heel and it popped it loose pretty quickly so I hope it didn't create any damage. Really I just need to take this all off of here now and take the neck out. It should be fairly straightforward hopefully and if there's damage well we'll repair the damage but at least it didn't take too long to get it out. Okay, now that that's off, we should be able to wiggle this and get this out of here. I don't know if it came out clean or not, but it came out. Well, actually, not too bad. Yeah, it's been shimmed a number of times. Well, actually, that's a broke out piece, but that's definitely a shim right here. There may be another shim in there, but it's definitely been re-glued more than once, that's for sure. So hopefully this will be the last time and we'll do it where it'll stay forever. Now that this has had a chance to dry out, I think you can see that there is a shim on this side that's left and there's a shim on this side that's left. When you turn around, they're on opposite sides. So obviously this is not the first rodeo on this guitar in terms of trying to fix the neck angle, but we will make it happen this time and I think we'll be able to fix it permanently. It's going to need a lot of cleanup, so that's all I'm going to do right now is I'm just going to get in there with chisels and scrapers and things and get rid of all of the old glue and all of the old shims and things like that and we'll start fresh. I was a Roman. time cleaning that up and I think it'll be okay. I'm probably going to build it back up and make it fit the joint tighter eventually. Although I haven't cleaned the other side yet and I don't know how loose it fits, but I suspect it will fit fairly loosely. I don't know what kind of glue was used in the last time that this was fixed, but it's very much like contact cement, which is kind of crazy. You wouldn't think they would use that. So it's probably not that, but it's something similar, at least in terms of its makeup, because it's very rubbery. It's not the kind of glue I would use for this for sure. Anyway, I'm trying to dig it all out of there and go back to bare wood because nothing will stick to that stuff. That stuff is just junk. So I'm probably going to have to dig this out a little bit oversized, just a little bit, you know, just to clean it all up and get rid of all that crud. It's just another one of those things you get into when you get into repairing old instruments. It's like trying to fix up old houses that have been cobbled up, you know. You never know what you're going to get into. You tear the walls off and you think, oh my gosh, who would have done such a thing? Well, that's kind of the way it is with these things. You wonder why they did what they did. We can clean it back to bare wood and then build it back up from there. Well, I've got 95% of the junk out of this. What I found inside the neck joint is that there were three layers of shims. There was glue on all layers, so I'm at least the third person to come in here and work on this neck since it left the factory. It's quite a mess. I cleaned it out and I found there was holes off on the sides dug into it that were full of glue also for no reason just sloppy work apparently and just big gouges and things that were just full of glue so i've shaved that off to get rid of 90 percent of that there's still a little bit of that left 
But anyway, I got rid of most of it. And now you can imagine the neck joint is crazy loose. It just, it's just flops back and forth, as you can see. And it also, if you tilt it forward, you can see there's a, you know, about a 3 8 inch void there. So it's very loose fit now. Obviously, we're gonna go have to shim it back, but my goal is to put one thick shim in there fill it out and then make it fit correctly and fit the neck angle correctly and you know just have to build it back that's the only thing i can do when you get into these kind of projects like this you just have to expect almost anything and you just have to be willing to do almost anything to put them back together because uh you know you can you can throw a band-aid at it and just throw some little thin shims in there but that's not the best way to do this one this is almost like a rebuild of the joint Another thing I'm cleaning up is there's a lot of glue on the surface here. You can see this is actually glue that I'm lifting up and pulling off. There's quite a bit of that. So I'm trying to clean all that off. And in addition, I've discovered another little mess here that I don't know what to do about this yet. I think you might be able to see that this binding is out proud of the side there. The side is kind of like it's pushed in. I'm wondering if this neck block couldn't be loose in addition to all the other problems. That would be a real mess. I don't think it is actually loose, at least not now, but I can't understand why it feels like it's pushed in right in here. In other words, the side isn't really perpendicular anymore. The side is slanted back toward the top here. I don't know. You know, I don't want to have to take it apart because that would really be a mess. So I think we're just going to live with that at least for now and see what problems we encounter with that. But anyway, I'm just trying to clean up the glue overage here so it looks a little nicer and neater. I'm also going to, you know, clean off the glue off of this kind of surfaces. Every surface you can get glue on and help hold is a good thing on a neck joint. I'm gonna clean off all of the finish along here and get down to bare wood on the front edge also so that we have something to glue to here as well. So it's a lot more work yet. You can see I've already cleaned off most of it, but I'm just using the round bladed X-Acto knife. I've tried all kinds of other scrapers on things like this and, and I tell you this is about the best. It's a flexible blade. It, you can feel it flex as you're scraping but yet it, it's very quick, it's very accurate because you've got that little point there that you can work with and you can just go right down to exactly what you wanna get. So now I think I'm gonna clean up this binding because the binding's actually sticking out proud of this and that will keep this from mating up flush and I want this completely flush. pretty good. I imagine the neck joint will even be looser now and it certainly is plenty loose but it also fits up better too to the body. I'm going to work on a lot of those little detailed points more and then I'll show you how we build the joint back up. In an effort to make this as strong as I can make it, I mean I could just shim right over the top of all of this but there's a big chip out right here. In fact you can even see glue in the chip out. So I know that this was done a long time ago. One of the other repairs caused this and it wasn't repaired. They just shimmed over it and that's not very strong. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna chisel this out square, put a little block of maple in there and then recarve it back to this so that it'll be the exact same. I'll show you what that looks like when I get the maple block fitted in there. There you can see the little plug I'm putting in there. Obviously it's bigger than it needs to be. I can glue that in there, clamp that in there and then shave it back down to the original and we can then start shimming this thing up and making it right. The night falls and the moon shines above I'm a man with a dream and a good woman You can see there that we've got the uh, little cleat fitted in there or to, it's just a fill piece I don't really know what to call it 
But uh, anyway, it's fitted in there and it's perfectly smooth now. So now if we have to shim all this, everything will be even and it'll be nice and solid. That won't come out of there for sure, especially glued with the tight bond and clamped. So it should be fine and we'll move on from there. Off camera, I put a straight edge on this and I put the bridge on here and with the straight edge going across, I had just about the right amount of clearance on the bridge when the neck was held tight to the body. So with that, I don't think I'm gonna have to cut anything off of the heel. I just think I need to put some wedges in here. And in fact, I've already made some, you know, test wedges, if you will. Let me show you what that looks like. And I just have them dry fitted in here right at the moment. You know, they're definitely oversized and that's what you wanna start with. You start with oversized wedges, get them glued in place. Then you can put them in here and just use the carbon paper trick and keep carving them down until they, they fit. And they'll fit perfectly tight then and you won't have all the wiggle issues that we've had in the past with this thing. And more than likely, it'll never need to be reset again once we do it with that method. Anyway, that feels real snug and tight. I don't feel anything wiggling in any direction when I put those in there. So I think that's a good starting point. It's, of course, way high, as you can see, but that gives me room to work them down. So that's the way I want to approach it. So here we go. So I think what I'm going to do is go ahead and get these glued on. I think I'm actually gonna use this as my clamp because that seems to be holding it very snug and very tight. Everything looks just airtight when I stick it in there. So I think that'll be the easiest way to clamp it. I just gotta make sure I get all the glue squeeze out cleaned up before I stick it down in there. for a little while. I'll come back in a few minutes and take it out of there just to make sure it's clamping up good and solid. If it's not, I'll put some additional clamps on it. Been using the carbon paper method to jam this down inside the neck joint. And you can see that it's, it's making pretty good contact. You know, you'll never see it totally black, but any place it's making contact, that's a high spot. And so all I'm doing is I just put the carbon paper inside here like so, jam this in there, and then I just carve those high spots off. As I get it in further, I like to leave them toward this end a little bit more so that that end stays tight because that's the end that has all the stress on it. But we're about to get there. It's still got a few ins and outs before we get there. This last little bit is probably the hardest part of fitting. You wanna to try to make sure you keep it tight the whole time. I've also rounded off these corners so that they don't grab. That could be the part that's keeping you from going in. As you can see right now, it's going pretty close to the end, although it's not quite there yet. And it's absolutely tight though. I could pick the guitar up and shake it by the neck and it won't come loose. It's really tight. It's fitting really well. There you can see it's pretty clean. So let's put the carbon paper in there and run it again and see what it looks like. And I squeeze it pretty tight each time. And there you go, you can see the black marks there that need to come off. It's actually working pretty well. It's getting pretty close. You can hurry this up and cut a lot more off. I try to cut a paper thin area off each time and take my time with it because it'll fit tighter if you do that. If you cut too much, you just make a big mess out of it. Didn't really have that in camera, but I just shaved all that off. Now we'll put it back in there and see if we're any closer. Each time it gets just a tiny bit closer, but only a tiny bit. So, you know, you just keep repeating the process. 
the other thing you have to do is make sure you're still straight in line you know with the body and all that kind of thing so there's there's multiple things you're checking this is not a five minute job here this takes a while to do and to do it really well I mean you can make them fit pretty quickly but to really make it fit where it won't ever be a problem again that's a different story yeah each time just a little bit closer but only a tiny bit and you just have to keep trying if you don't have patience this is where you everything goes wrong right here and this is where it needs to go right well I'll keep doing that and I'll show you what it looks like when we get her fitting up well I'm just didn't have the video camera turned on, but I was happy with the joint and I've got it glued and stuck together. It is a really tight joint, probably the tightest joint I believe I ever fit. It's absolutely no play in it whatsoever. The neck angle is very good. If anything, I'll be truthful. You know, I could use just a hair more neck angle, but I got all I could get out of it, you know, and make it fit tight, you know. But uh, it's not bad at all. I think we'll be able to uh, just get it clamped up, let it sit 24 hours and get the strings on this baby. I think we'll be done. Well, friends, I believe I've mentioned in a video or two how unique all these tuning keys are. Almost as many guitars as there are, there's that many kinds of tuning keys. It's just weird how, you know, there was no real standard and you would find the same keys on multiple guitars. That didn't seem to be the case back then in the day, so to speak. And here's a very unique set right here. You don't see this very often. I think I've only seen this one other time. And that is as soon as you take these off of the guitar, then these are instantly loose. And you notice how they fold forward? When they fold forward, then they drop out, see? You drop them right out and put them back in and then you cock them back to lock them into place. There's nothing else holding them in, that's it. It's just the tension of the strings is the only thing that's really holding them in place. It's amazing, the technology and the different kinds of tuning keys that you run across. And here's a look at their gears on the back side. As you can see, there's no screws in the ends of these, so those don't come off. These posts are permanently attached to their ring gear there. And then the worm across there, it's pretty much permanently mounted into these two things. There's really no way to take it apart either. There's not much you can do to these keys to uh, work on them too much. I am going to pop these things out, I believe. I'm going to keep them in the place they are because I don't want to get them out of order. I think I am going to take them completely apart and polish all the metal up on this and clean up the metal. Well, we're on the dark side over here, and here's the wire wheel that you can see. We'll light it up here in a moment with this light bulb that you can't see off camera. I just want to tell you that anytime you're using a wire wheel, you never use it without wearing some safety glasses. This thing throws wires continually and they can easily end up in your eye. You have to be a real man because they will end up in your skin. I've had them stick in my arm already. You know, you just have to be careful, but it is a dangerous uh, piece of machinery in the shop and you should respect it. Definitely never use it without eye protection. Here we go. This also can grab your part and throw it on the ground and I'm gonna be very careful with that. It's all about the angle that you touch it into it. So I'm going to be very careful, but there's no doubt that I'll probably end up dropping at least one or two pieces by the time we're done. So here we go. I thought I'd just show you a before and after on the first one here, and then the rest of them I'm just going to do off camera. Since I don't have any other way to get you light at the moment, I'm going to turn the grinder back on. You're going to hear the noise, but you'll at least be able to see it, I think. Not a very good picture, sorry. But I think you can still see the before and the after. It's, camera's having trouble focusing on that. But this one's very tarnished, this one's much shinier. I'll show them to you on the other camera later. You can possibly see that because of the new neck angle, these pieces here aren't on the top anymore. So I've made some fill pieces that can go in here and fill this up. I've only made the one on the one side right now, but I'm ready to glue it in place, I believe. Just squeeze a little tight bond in there, move it around just a little bit, and then I'm just gonna put this in place. You can see it's kind of in there. I'm gonna check it now real close. Well, 
with the little minor exception of the extensions that I put under there, and you have to be looking for those, you can't tell that I took this apart. I was able to put the original fret right back in, in the exact same place. Now, that hole still shows up. I did not drill the hole, as you know, it was already there. So I am going to fill the hole and then we'll dye it. And once again, I don't bother with the uh, stained dyes. This stuff dyes real easy. And, uh, my leather dyes do a real good job of dyeing it, so I'm not worried about dyeing it at, at all. I could have filled the hole before I put the fret in, but I just thought, well, I'll just fill it afterwards. And the reason for that was whenever that fret gets pulled again, someone else will see the hole instantly. You know, they won't re-drill another hole if it ever gets pulled again. I don't think it will ever get pulled again because I don't think this neck reset will ever need to be redone. And ever is a big word. Uh, I don't think it will. I, th I think this will last pretty much for the life of the instrument. Because it was done well and it was really tight and I don't think it'll ever come loose again. So, now that's assuming no one puts uh, crazy heavy strings on it. So you can see there, that's what it looks like right now. We'll get a little bit of dye on this and touch it up. And I don't think you'll be able to tell it at all. This thing's just about ready to put strings back on it, but before I do that, I'm gonna do a light fret job on it. You can see how cruddy those frets are and how quickly they shine up, and you can see because they instantly turn the brass color. They're so tarnished. That's looking really fine. The way I do this is I look at the blemishes, the deepest blemishes, and I file till I get down to just about where that deepest blemish is just about to go away. And that's where I stop. And the reason is because I don't want to take off any more than I have to. Now we still got a little bit of a blemish right here in the middle. I don't think it's much. I'm gonna file a little bit more back here. I think this tang might be just a little high anyway. <laughs> I think that's pretty darn good. And now for the final polishing on these frets, I'm using 600 grit sandpaper. And once again, uh, for the people that are concerned that this will leave lines in the frets, it's absolutely slick when you're done. It's just as slick as it can be. And it's 10 times faster than any other method. And that saves you money as the customer. And it makes them beautiful. Not quite as shiny as my old buddy Randy makes them because he does a great job on that. And he kind of specializes in that and makes them look wonderful, but this almost makes them mirror-like, not quite mirror-like. And if you look at them really close up, you'll see what I'm talking about. They're just really perfect. Now, granted, the fretboard itself is nasty dirty, but that's actually a good thing from my perspective because now I can see what needs to be cleaned up. It accentuates the holes, just as this fret as an example. You can see where it looks like there's holes and everything. Now we'll just go through that really quickly and clean that up. And we won't get all the holes out because there are places where they're very, very deep. But I think just quickly there, you can see how much better that fret looks than the adjoining frets. Now there's that one really deep groove. There's some really deep ones in there where the fingernails just wore out a big deep slot and we're not gonna be able to fix that perfectly. So we're just gonna be able to get close and that's gonna be about it. 
I mean, we could fill it, but uh, that fill just looks bad in my opinion. I'd rather see it just with the hole there myself than to have the fill in it. But everybody has their own opinion on that. This cleans off the old DNA, as Randy would say also. It, uh, that DNA, you know, it just builds up. There's just gunk on there. And this gets rid of all of that. And it looks really nice once you put the oil on it. And this method also keeps the inlays perfectly flat where you can't feel the inlays. really looking nice now you can see much nicer looking fretboard even with the holes in it it still looks much nicer we're going to clean it up a little bit more and then we'll oil it now I'm just scraping right against each fret so that we get rid of that little bit of buildup that's right against each fret now so we're getting ready to put the boiled linseed oil on and there's what it looks like before and I'll just pick a few frets in the middle there to douse them with this and you can kind of see what it looks like after just does a really nice job makes it look a lot more rich a little darker just looks real nice it makes it look smooth makes it look just about like it did when it came from the factory and it would look just like it did came from the factory if it weren't for these big fingernail grooves. So people, cut your fingernails. How many times do I have to say it? <laughs> I'm kidding, but doggone it, that is the reason for those grooves. It's the fingernails. I call it OMFNS, old man fingernail syndrome. Their fingernails get as hard as steel, you know, and just cut right in there. But that looks about as good as it's gonna look. I think we're going to call it a day and we're going to finish this up in the morning. Well, actually, I've just decided I'm going to change my mind right on camera here and I'm going to put the oil over this whole top. The top is finished. This oil will just kind of clean it up and make it look a lot better, more uniform. It doesn't do too much cleaning, but it does a little bit of cleaning in addition to just making it look more uniform. And wherever there's bare wood it just is good to have it on there anyway so it'll just kind of seal up the top a little bit better now that looks better already don't you think now we got to dry that off of course but that just makes it look so much more cared for and much more uniform i just love the way that looks in order to do a good job of cleaning these keys up after putting them on the wire wheel there's still places you can't get into so I'm taking a fine strip of sandpaper putting it on a little wedge piece of wood that I can get into tighter places and get in and clean out these different tarnished areas so that at least it all has one look it doesn't look like it's tarnished in some places and you know cleaned up and shiny in other places so I just thought I'd show you what I'm doing and I'll give you a close-up of the detail of a comparison between the one I've cleaned and the one I haven't when I'm finished here. I think there's a significant difference there that you can see. You know, some people would say you're destroying the patina, but in my opinion, rust is not patina. We took the rust off of all this stuff and the dark tarnish off of it and we cleaned it up and it will naturally darken over time again, but it just won't be as nasty looking, and the camera keeps going in and out of focus. But anyway, there you go. You can see it's, it's much nicer looking than, than that, at least in my opinion. Now that I have both sets of tuner keys cleaned up, I'm going to take a stiff paintbrush and just apply the uh, Renaissance wax, well, I'm gonna just put it everywhere because I, th I think it'll actually make everything work better. I'm not sure that it will make it work better, but I think it will. But for one thing, it should keep it preserved and it won't tarnish f so quickly. And when the night falls and the moon shines above. Well, that one's all clean.
cleaned up, waxed up, and it's ready to go back in the guitar. Now I'm gonna fill all the screw holes. They're a little wallered out. They probably would be fine, but it doesn't hurt to fill them. And you know, that way, you know the screws are gonna hold that way. I just use the toothpicks. I know a lot of people have told me, use something else, it fills them faster, whatever. I really do like to use the toothpicks because when the holes get wallered out, they uh, are often odd shaped and you can just keep putting toothpicks in there and it'll fill the whole shape. And when they're not wallered out, like these are not too bad, then just one toothpick in each hole is fine. It just takes up the space is all it amounts to. One thing you will run into occasionally is sometimes you'll get a toothpick that won't break. It just has the grain cut just right where it just leaves a string. So you're better off just getting a different toothpick and starting over. Not that it really makes too much difference, but I have been very careful all through this process to keep the same peg in the same hole. I figured they were wore that way and so they might as well stay that way. The tailpiece is significantly scarred on this also from rust. And again, in my opinion, that's not patina, that's rust. So I'm going to take just this part to the wire wheel. The rest of this, I'm just gonna polish up with semi-chrome polish. But we can clean the rest of this up, I think, just by that. But this here needs significantly more and the wire wheel is the way to go, in my opinion. Well, I thought I had the camera on, but I don't guess I did. I just buffed this out with the semi-chrome polish. I first went over this part with the wire wheel, then I also buffed it out with the semi-chrome, and it sure looks a lot nicer. I have not done anything to these wires yet, so I'm just gonna take the semi-chrome on the wires and uh, see if we can't make them look better too. You can just see the tarnish coming off there. It's really a lot. Get a clean area there and we'll do it again. You can just see it, it just really does do a nice job. The only thing left is the two little buttons on the end. Let's see if we can't clean them up just a little bit too. Nothing dramatic, but it's working. Well, for my money, that looks significantly better. You know, it doesn't look new. That's not the goal. It seems like the Renaissance wax is good for just about everything, so I'm gonna go ahead and coat, especially this part down here where the rust was with the, uh, with the wax. I know it's got to help it uh, maintain the, the look if we just coat it with the wax like this. These other parts are still have their nickel coating over them, so I don't think it's as critical to put it on there, but it won't hurt to put it on there either, so I probably will put a little bit on there. Well, I think that's ready to go back on. Oh, I'm a man with a dream. We just about got this guitar ready to go. I do know this customer is pretty particular on his setups. You know, I've got this down to about 80 to 85 right now on the bass side and about the same on the treble. Actually, the treble might be a hair higher. I can lower the treble side very easily. So I'll lower it a little bit there. And the treble side's pretty close to the same now. What I'm doing actually is I'm working on the nut up here. The nut is fine in my opinion, except that the grooves are awfully deep in the nut. So I'm just taking the tops off of the nut here to bring it down to closer to where the strings are. The treble strings are just a hair high, so I'm gonna remove them and, and drop them down just a little bit also. My friends, if you remember when I took this guitar apart, it had a strap button right there and it was that long. <laughs> Goes all the way into the guitar, which I don't wanna do that again. So I'm going to fill that hole, put the strap button back on there. I'm not gonna show you that, but uh, that's what I'm gonna do. Well, my friends, I'm happy to tell you the Sherwood Standard is back in good playing shape. In fact, I bet it hasn't been in that good a shape in many, many, many years. Maybe never that good a shape in terms of the neck angle. And a nice sound. Yeah, 
it's got a good sound. It's a nice guitar. It's good and solid. There's really nothing wrong with it at all. It ought to last, I would say it ought to last at least another 50 years without anybody doing anything to it at all. Just a little bit of TLC is all it needs. If you'd like to hear me sing and play a song on this, well, let me know in the comments because those haven't been watched all that much and there are a lot of work to put out. So if you think that's something you want, well, then let me know and we'll do some more of that. Right now, I just want to thank you for watching this neck reset on this guitar and this restoration, if you will, or whatever you want to call that. But uh, it turned out really nice. I couldn't be much happier with it. Thank you very much for watching. Let, let.